Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our sixth virtual meeting, Resiliency on the Front Lines, a Lunch and Learn. Before we get started, I'd like to run over a few housekeeping items so everyone knows how to participate in today's event. First off, if, and if you or someone you know is in an immediate mental health crisis, please call 911 or call 1-866-COP-2-COP. That's 1-866-267-2267. Next, all lines are on mute. So if you find that you're having any technical difficulties at any point during our presentation, please explain your problem through the chat feature and we will try our best to address the issue. Next, we are recording this town hall uh, and lunch and learn discussion. So in the video, will be available on our YouTube page within 24 hours. Please subscribe to New Jersey OAG on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Flickr for the latest updates on information, resources, and news from our office. Next, I'd like to hand things off to our host and moderator today, Attorney General Gabriel Graywall. Thank you, Whitney, and thank you all for joining us to talk about an incredibly important topic, resiliency on the front lines. Uh, this is a topic that's incredibly personal to me as well. Uh, in November of 2018, I had the incredible honor and privilege of meeting with Mercer County Sheriff's Officer Pablo Santiago, and that meeting had a profound effect on me. The same way that learning of his suicide nearly a month later also had a profound effect on me. It highlighted to me that we do an incredible job preparing our law enforcement officers for external threats, but not a good job for preparing them to deal with the internal threats. We give them bulletproof vests when they go out in public into dangerous situations, but then we give them nothing to deal with the impact that those dangerous situations have on them when they come home and are dealing with the fallout of whatever crisis that they have seen that day. That prompted me to take steps at the Attorney General's office to come up with the framework, a statewide framework, where we can make the mental health and wellness of our officers a top priority. About a year later in October of the following year in 2019, we stood up our statewide resiliency program. We had a two day summit at the War Memorial and we talked about how we could have resiliency program officers in each of our police departments, how we could have master resiliency trainers and how we could have partners like cop to cop and Shri Castellano, who you'll, hear, who you'll hear from in a moment, where we could teach our officers to spin up in the face of adversity, give them those techniques to cope with those threats. But we, we could also have a helpline available to them if they need help in a moment of crisis. So with that, I wanna to turn to Shri Castellano, from cop to cop. She's a program director there, and she's also a leading expert when it comes to behavioral health care and crisis when it in, in connection with law enforcement officers. She's an incredible, incredible human being, and I'm thankful to have her as a partner in our resiliency efforts. Shree, welcome. And I wanna just kick it off by asking you to describe what cop to cop is for our audience that might not be familiar with it. Thank you so much, General. Thank you for your passionate and sincere allows us to do what we need to do. Um, I think I think the, the sort of quick history of Cop to Cop is that we've spent 20 years serving officers, using retired law enforcement officers as professional peer counselors. And in 90,000 contacts, what we found is that these officers um, really only respond to each other. That although you have terrific mental behavioral health care brochures and resources and employee assistance programs, they're not going to use them because the culture is so connected. They are their brother and sister's keeper, and they need to have a confidential, trusted resource from someone who has a shared lived experience and really gets what they're going through when they're in a time of need. I think what we also found out was that the traditional old school way of kind of training people in suicide prevention and giving them statistics wasn't a way to connect to them. That we needed to be out in the community, we need to be on the phones, we need to be proactive. And what we found with cop to cop is that it's a reciprocal experience. The 20 plus guys that we have working at cop to cop who are retired um, say they get as much as they give when they answer these calls and provide this peer counseling. And so over the 20 years, there's been some pivotal changes. Um, I think when we first started, 9-11 helped define our work and we figured out that we needed to do crisis intervention in addition to peer support to really help officers. And then I think again at around 2009, when there was a spike in suicides, we recognized that we need to really look at our work and see where we were challenged. And what we found was that people might not reach out till it was too late, 
They might have concerns about confidentiality. Um, they might think that a retired guy maybe wasn't as relatable as somebody who was active in their community. So that fast forwards us to your initiative, which really was the answer to many prayers and sort of the evolution of the work to two decades of success. And I should mention, I'm going to brag a little about the guys that were a national best practice, according to the Department of Defense and American Psychiatric Association. So we have accomplished a lot, but what we were missing was that real active officer connection. And so when you initiated the RPO program, it just changed everything for us. Well, yeah, let me jump in there for a quick second. You mentioned a couple of things that, that I think are important to highlight. One is confidentiality. The, the interactions with cop to cop are, are, are obviously confidential and have to be in order for them to work. There can't be a fear of retaliation or adverse employment consequences. So that's one of the things that we've tried to stress in the resiliency uh, program that we put forward. And the other thing that we did was we understood that law enforcement officers might not feel comfortable going to an RPO in their own agency, so they can go to an RPO in any agency. We want to make that list available to them so they could take advantage of it. And the other aspect of it is that the PBA and the and the uh, the, the organizations, the unions, can have their own RPOs available to officers. But uh, focusing on the RPO program, how has that changed or enhanced the work that you're able to do to, to bring the mental health and well-being of our officers to the forefront and give them all the resources they need right now. Yeah, so to just sort of touch on the highlights, because it really has been a, a program changing and a life changing experience for me as a police officer's wife, as well as someone who's been leading this initiative for 20 years. Um, but I think what we see is that the RPOs are really the most resilient officers in their agencies and they were so well selected. And so when this began, one of the things we knew automatically was not only were they gonna need us if an officer had an issue that was gonna be complicated and we didn't want them to be in a precarious position to be professional counselors or peer counselors, or act like licensed clinicians when they're not, but we knew that we could fill that gap by having the cop to cop line partner with them in sort of a perfect way to let them be on the front lines, talk about resilience, talk about coaching, and then if an officer had a more acute need or a real problem that needed attention, we could have this collaboration between a liaison at cop to cop and the RPOs. What happened, which was phenomenal, was that we also started to recognize from our research over the years that our peer counseling lasts about six months, and then an officer goes back to normal. It's not always this very acute suicidal situation. They get peer counsel and they go back to work. So what can we do with them? So now we could refer to the RPOs. So we were able to look into our provider database all the RPOs, so now we can hand off to the RPOs and say, hey, I have a guy who was in crisis or had a problem, but now is doing well and needs to have that affirmed, and we're gonna send them back to you, and we can use the RPOs as a resource in addition to sort of supporting them. So it was a reciprocal resource. And so what we did was we designed this database enhancement, we participated in the summit that you mentioned, we collected surveys on their health and the providers they wanted to use, we put that all into the, the program elements of cop to cop to enhance it, and then assigned cop to cop staff to specific squads when we did the master resiliency training with them in the end of February. What was unanticipated, even though that training was superb, was that we thought they were gonna go out into the communities, there wasn't gonna be COVID, and we were gonna sure. sort of move in the academies and the agencies that they were gonna kick off, right? And, and instead, COVID happened. And so that just <laughs> another incredible opportunity. And how, how has COVID affected the work that you're doing? Have you changed uh, anything? Have you changed your approach? Have you seen an uptick in calls? Uh, yes. Can you just share some some examples? And, and perhaps yes. the question I get is, is this working? Is yes. any of this working? Yes. Perhaps you could address that. Right. So, I mean, law enforcement officers are always like about stick to the facts, right? So the facts are in March and April, we had 677 contacts with RPOs. I just checked the numbers in May, it's 501. And so we are talking to the RPOs and part of that was by design. We recognized from our research and work during 9-11 20 years ago that officers don't reach out in the middle of a crisis. They're too busy rescuing everyone else. They are just trying to do their jobs and take care of everyone in their beautiful selfless way. But someone needs to take care of them amidst all that. So what we decided that we would design an outreach campaign. We called the 200 master resiliency trainers with their assigned cop to cop peers and designed a script to talk to them about COVID and wellness plans 
their self-care as well as what did their officers need. And what we found is they were super receptive. They were the people that everyone was going to because they were the well-respected, resilient officers in their agencies. And they asked us for things like virtual debriefings over the many deaths that the officers have been exposed to because of COVID. They asked us for responses to suicide by cop. They asked us for referrals for family members based on, on suicides. So we were able to really get to work right away with this outreach campaign. And we're calling them every week for 90 days. We think we're gonna extend it to 120 days because of the success. But it's been an incredible crisis um, intervention tool because they're out there and we're not. And it's been amazing. It is, it is truly amazing. And we're gonna talk about the specific role of the RPOs when we talk to Detective Bird. But just for those who are, who are watching this and are not familiar with the program, these are the, the officers on the ground who are interacting at the department level and dealing with tragedy and grief sometimes or, or an officer coming in for help. And then the folks that cop to cop are the backstop. And that, that contact between the two is what's allowing this program to thrive and to succeed. And by success, we mean that we're available and that we're, we're preventing perhaps the next tragedy. It's hard to quantify, but I know from, from the, 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 the work that Cherie's doing, we are helping and, and touching so many law enforcement officers and having that point of contact that didn't exist uh, as, as widespread before. Uh, one, one last question before we go on to Sergeant Gonzalez. Uh, what about other first responders? Are there any resources available to them like this? Uh, or is there some plans for, for more resources to come available to other first responders, nurses, uh, EMTs, and others? Yes. Yeah, so over the years, we've always taken our guidance from the Disaster Terrorism Branch in New Jersey under the Division of Mental Health and Addiction Services. And they are the primary point of contact whenever there's a disaster for all types of organizations. The numbers that you see there are a variety of numbers that the state offers for both suicide response, but really for some FEMA crisis counseling immediate access to care. What we hope for, and of course the chaplains and, and our Vets for Warriors number, what we hope for in the future, and it's nothing is awarded yet, but there have been planning discussions to, um, you know, hope for some federal funding to provide FEMA crisis counseling to high-risk populations such as police, fire, and EMS, as well as to healthcare workers, nurses, and those other heroes on the front lines. Sheree, thank you for the incredible work that you're doing. Thank you for the incredible partnership with our resiliency program. We'll circle back with you at the end of the program. Uh, I wanna switch over to Sergeant Antonia Gonzalez from the Long Branch Police Department. Uh, we touched on this uh, a second ago in talking to Sheree about the culture in law enforcement. One of the things we wanted to do when we had that resiliency summit in October of last year was to bring out and fill the war memorial. We had over 2000 law enforcement officers there to talk about mental health. And the reason we wanted to do it with such a big splash was that we wanted to draw the stigma away from this topic. We wanted to show that seeking help is a sign of strength, not a sign of weakness. Uh, and I think a perfect example of how the culture has changed is the work that Sergeant Gonzalez has done in, in the Long Branch Police Department. Sergeant Gonzalez, welcome. Can you tell us about the resiliency room and everything that you're doing in your department? Yes, thank you. I'm so honored to be here today and thank you for wanting to hear about this resiliency room. Um, this all started after um, I was chosen to be a resiliency officer. And after I came back, one of the captains uh, asked us to, he said, do you guys have numbers so we can get services for our officers? Uh, the other, uh, there's two other resiliency officers, Captain Rizzuto and, and Officer Ross. Officer Ross got numbers together and everything. Um, and I said to the captain, I said, I have an idea that I think we I think would be really helpful for police officers. I said, what can we do? It took a couple months for us to do this. Um, and what we decided was to have this, I, I decided to come up with this room, this room where it, a wellness room where they can go in and they can have their uh, meals in there. They can sit and relax. And more importantly, if they needed to speak to someone, if they needed someone there would be privacy because a lot of times in when there's critical incidents there's a lot going on in a police department and the last thing someone wants to do is say you know what I'm not feeling this I need to speak to somebody and then when you say you want to speak to someone everyone's looking at you 
all right? So it was really, really beneficial, and it was actually an honor for this captain, and I have to give him props. His name is Captain Silverio. Um, he is, he listened, and he never said, you know what? That's not doable. What he said was, let's do it. So I'm pretty, pretty pumped about it and super, super honored that he actually had took the time to listen and and look, this is this is it's a reality. And and what, is it located at the police department or is it off site? It is off site, um, and we do not talk about the location because we also want to keep our officers safe. Of course, yeah. uh, it, it's there was a local business owner that decided to help us, and we transformed this room into a really nice room. Officers from this police department came together, from lieutenants to captains to even our, everyone came together and started bringing things from their home to fill this resiliency room. Uh, and it's from furniture to, I want to tell you, I made some curtains. I know I throw that out there. Uh, and one of the guys brought a refrigerator. We had a microwave that someone had in their garage. It really was a collaborative effort from everyone wanting to make this work. You know, I, I don't think uh, members of the general public appreciate how far this goes. I, I don't think members of the public sometimes appreciate how you, uh, Sergeant Gonzalez, and other law enforcement officers are always on. When you're in public and you're eating a meal in the car or you're, you're just sitting in your car and, and you might be trying to take a break or have a little bit of downtime, you're always on and, and you're always under scrutiny and somebody could always reach out to you. And I think one of the things that struck me uh, I didn't realize it is, you know, I can close my door and have lunch and, and no one's going to bother me. Uh, and it's just as simple as somebody having a place to go just to have that five minutes of quiet or 10 minutes of quiet during the day. And, and even that goes a long way. Yes, uh, you're right, sir. What what one of the biggest things is not being able to have a meal at, in peace. And when you think about what that does to a human body, anybody, think about it. We're on all the time. And then now you have to rush and eat your meal and you have to look around. Your head has to be on a swivel because let's be honest, it is not a safe thing to sit in your vehicle and have a meal. So Captain Silverio actually was the one that said, let's do it this way. And I thought it was pretty cool. And I have to say that it was a great, great idea because when you can sit down and eat a meal in peace and just have a few minutes to unwind, because you never know what's going on in someone's life, what they just saw. It is just so key. It is a key, key concept. And I just, I'm super pumped about it, if you can't tell. <laughs> I, I, I absolutely love your enthusiasm. I love everything that you're doing down there. Thank you. Uh, it, you know, on the cultural issue, did you get any pushback whatsoever? It sounds like everyone was on board from uh, the, the moment you proposed this. No, I did not. I, I know that from the time that I spoke to Captain Silverio and the time that it took for us to put it all together, I never heard anything. I never heard anything bad. I think everybody was open to it. I think it's time to start working on these kinds of things. And, you know, mental health is something that some people cringe when they hear it. But you know what? We're all human. We need this in our lives. It doesn't even have to be only first responders. It can be in other areas as well, you know? So that's that's how I feel about it. Now, are, are you doing anything different right now during COVID to, to help your officers uh, deal with the, the special stresses that this situation presents? You know, I know the struggles with PPE and I know the, the struggles of, of trying to not bring it home and, and keep your family and loved ones safe. Uh, what are you doing uh, in connection with COVID to help your officers remain resilient? In, in our police department, they changed our hours. Uh, we're back to normal today. Uh, but what they did was they really did a good job with uh, isolating us from you know the two weeks and then two weeks on the they opened that resiliency room right when we were when this announced this everything with covid was announced so it was really great to have that room open i did go up there to check to see if it was being used because that's like a, the mom in me right and i did see that people were using it because i saw trash in the trash. so i was like this is great so i think it was really really a great thing to open it up at that time because we were going to wait but then when this happened the captain's like, let's open it up, and everybody was on board. Uh, I absolutely love it. Thank the captain. Thank the chief. W what's next for you and your department in, in these? You, you're, you're a pioneer, and you're leading the way, and I know others are following, but what's next? Thank you. What we want is to create 
a program to have officers, if they need something, they're gonna have it. And if they need to talk to somebody, I'm really big on therapy and I don't care who rolls their eyes on me at, at, at what I'm gonna say. And you said it earlier, and I always say this when I talk to people about stress and how it affects first responders, there's actually no shame in asking for help. When you ask for help, you're, you're showing strength. You're saying, you know what? I need someone to hold me up right now. It may just be a few minutes, but let someone hold you. Let somebody hold you and help you. And then you can help someone else. I, I love it. Thank you for your, everything that you're doing. Thank you for your enthusiasm. And thank you for leading the way uh, with the wellness rooms. And, and it's my hope that we see these in all of our police departments one day because they are an important tool uh, in, in making the well-being and, and mental health wellness and overall wellness of our officers a top priority. We'll circle back with you uh, at the end of the program. But uh, now I want to jump to uh, Detective thank Matt you. Bird. Uh, from our Division of Criminal Justice at the Attorney General's Office. Uh, Matt's a 20-year first responder. Uh, he is, uh, he's got many degrees and is working on his uh, PhD, as a matter of fact, right now in human and social services. And I know he wants to focus on first responder resiliency uh, in his studies and, and uh, I guess the next career. You've had a number of careers to date, Matt. Uh, but you're doing terrific work, uh, and you're also involved uh, in the PBA uh, at, at the uh, Division of Criminal Justice, uh, representing uh, the men and women uh, who serve there. Uh, I'd love to just have your view uh, on, on from a 30,000-foot level on the RPO program uh, and, and what your role is as an RPO as well. All right. Uh, thank you, General. I appreciate that. Um, it's good to be here with Cherie and Sergeant Gonzalez. Uh, very important topic. Um, Back in the fall, and I want to thank you, General, as well, um, for implementing this resiliency directive uh, last fall. And then also, I'd, I'd like to say thank you to Rob Sepul, our Chief Resiliency Officer for the state, um, and also Holly Lees, who's our uh, Resiliency Program Coordinator, uh, both of these individuals from the Division of Criminal Justice. So um, the three of you have really shown how you care for cops, and, and we, all, we all appreciate that. Um, the resiliency program, we teach four domains of resiliency, the, the mental, the physical, the social, and the spiritual. And as um, resiliency program officers, our job is to bring that to every single officer um, in our agencies. So we started out this past March with um, master, resilience or master resiliency training for our MRTs, who now will turn around and train RPOs, who then are available for educating uh, our police officers, as well as being um, somebody to listen if people need people to talk to. And then also, as uh, Cherie spoke about, um, we are a medium to get our officers in touch with um, things like cop to cop or employee assistance plan. So that's where we're at um, right now. The resiliency program at DCJ, um, our staff there put out two different things to have for outreach. Uh, we have a resilient NJ monthly newsletter um, and then also available online is uh, Resilient Minds on the Front Lines. And that's a webcast uh, that's that's put out um, frequently, just talking about the different ways that, that police officers can, can remain resilient. Um, but as the other two people spoke about, uh, we're really looking to change the, the culture, uh, destigmatize uh, mental health among first responders. Um, 19 years ago, when I was returning from, uh, from Ground Zero with the EMS task force, uh, this type of resiliency program wasn't available. Um, it was, and, and even if it had been available, uh, it's not something that, that I would have reached out for uh, because we had this tough guy mentality. We had this, you gotta suck it up, you gotta be strong. Uh, we're the first responders, we're there to help. We don't need our own help. So, so it's good that this program's rolling out, destigmatizing um, mental health and, and helping coach officers to be as healthy as they can for their communities, uh, their friends, and, and especially their families, so. Hey, Matt, th thanks for highlighting uh, the crow, as I call him, our chief resiliency officer, Rob Sepial, and, and obviously Holly Lees, who just does an incredible job uh, at DCJ in so many different ways. Uh, they really make the program run. And so uh, thank you for highlighting uh, their work and thank you for highlighting uh, the, the video uh, webcasts. Uh, I think they're an incredible tool as well, where you have, I think about 14 episodes that are available out there. 
Uh, and so I'd encourage everyone to check those out. Um, and I think they're available through the OAG website or the DCJ website. Um, but uh, practically speaking, can you share some of, examples of some of the things that you're doing uh, at this time to, to remain resilient uh, during COVID-19? Sure. Um, as an RPO program at Division of Criminal Justice, um, in March, when we all knew we were going to start working remotely, we had a conference call among all the RPOs. Um, and from that point, we took different names of, uh, of, of officers that we knew that we were comfortable with um, in all the units, and not just officers, but our professional staff, our deputy attorneys general. Uh, and we be began to reach out through phone calls, through text messages, just to get a feeling of, of how everybody was doing. Uh, we're, we're challenged, whereas in a normal uh, situation, you would be able to see people's body language. You'd be able to see them in the office several days a week. Um, so it's very hard to kind of gauge that from home via you know remote communication. Uh, but we have been able to reach out with folks. Our union as well has been sending out resources, reaching out to people, uh, making sure that they're doing all right. And we've actually been able to make several referrals to cop to cop uh, as, as uh, you spoke about and Cherie spoke about, these things are confidential. And it's, it's good to see that our officers trust us enough to bring their issues to us and then also allow us to refer them to cop to cop. So we've heard some, some good responses back to that. Um, and then just going forward, we're just reaching out um, through every avenue we had. So our RPOs are reaching out, our union continues to reach out. Our supervisors are doing a fantastic job um, making sure that everybody is okay. So, yeah, I, I think that can't be stressed enough. How, in, in as we're socially distanced, because we know we need to be to push back against this pandemic and and to control this virus, uh, that distancing is making us disconnected in some ways. But I think through efforts uh, such as the ones that you've outlined, by making those phone calls, by having those one-on-one uh, -on -one calls or, or or conference calls, you're you're getting back in touch and you're 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 taking that initiative to see how people are doing. And uh, I want to thank Rob Sepiel who who checked in on me. Uh, during the midst of the pandemic and our response as the chief resiliency officer to make sure I was okay. Uh, and I think that goes a long way, just that small phone call and that little check-in. Uh, but how does Matt Bird stay resilient? <laughs> um, well, as I spoke about before, we have, there's four domains of resiliency and that's um, that's mental, physical, social, and uh, and spiritual. Um, and, and what I try to remind myself is that this isn't actually social distancing uh, because we can remain social. This is physical dis uh, distancing. So um, the way I stay socially connected is uh, through phone calls, through a, a, a biweekly lunch meeting with, uh, with my PBA uh, executive staff. And then also uh, at the beginning of this, my, my girlfriend has a wonderful group of friends who came up with the idea of, you know, every Friday, uh, let's just meet up on Facebook um, and have a, a virtual meeting where, you know, we do the same things we would have done if we met in person. Um, Staying connected to my kids' school as well. Um, they do an all-school gathering every Friday via Zoom, so we get to see the faces of uh, every, everybody in the school. Um, virtual Cub Scout meetings, campaigns. Um, on a spiritual side, uh, I keep connected with my church through YouTube messages, YouTube worship services. Um, and then on a mental side, um, I regularly reach out to my own counselor. Um, as Cherie talked about, we are all assigned to uh, a, a cop to cop representative as an RPO. Um, I reach out to that individual as well. Uh, you know, my family, uh, my friends, my coworkers, um, also my my supervisor. You know, not just as checking in with my boss, but you know, he's my friend as well. So checking in with my with my friend. Um, unfortunately, the last tenant of uh, of that is physical, and uh, that's something <laughs> I have to have to work on. Uh, you know, you're you're working remotely. You don't always get a chance to uh, make time for yourself physically. You know, run, lift. You know, gyms are closed. So so that's how I that's how I've been been managing the best that I can. So. Well, thank you. And you don't have to remind me that gyms are closed. Uh, I am uh, <laughs> I'm dealing with the front and center. So thank you for doing uh, everything that you do uh, at CJ as an RPO, as a detective. Uh, it's truly appreciated. Uh, and to your point, while we might be physically distanced, we have over uh, 300 people uh, tuning in to hear this uh, webcast. And I think in a normal situation, 
it would be difficult to get 300 people focused on the topic of resiliency. And in some ways, we're probably getting more connected. I'm going to try to keep it to a 30-minute session. We started a minute late. So what I'd like to do is get all of our panelists uh, on, on the screen uh, and hit them with one final question uh, and then sign off after uh, after each uh, has an opportunity to answer that. And we'll start with Sheree and then go to Sergeant Gonzalez and finish with Matt. Uh, folks, what's one piece of advice or one suggestion that you'd give to someone listening today who's in need of help? Shri? Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head in the theme of even though we're social distanced and we feel disconnected, you, you have people to connect to. So you're surrounded by them. This is a chance to get close to your family, to get close to your faith, to get close to your physical health or even what's wrong around your house or dreams in your <laughs> life. The slowing down allows us an opportunity to think about what's strong, not what's wrong, and try to build on that. So just stay focused on connection and know that we're all standing by to connect to you too, if you really, if you need anything. I love it. Thank you. It's 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 you could view it as a recalibration, a time to reprioritize, uh, and right. that's certainly one of the techniques I'm employing. Thank you for all that you do, Sheree Sergeant Gonzalez. Same question. I, I want to say to everyone that we have to pay attention to how we feel and how our bodies and all these things coming together. Pay attention to what you're feeling. And if you need to talk to someone, talk to someone. If you need, if you feel something in your body, schedule an appointment with the doctor. They're doing teleconferences. Don't ignore anything. There's so many resources out here. There's so many people that want to help you. Don't do it alone. We can help you stand up. Love it. Matt, last, last words. Sure. Um, so the one thing that I would express to all the police officers out there is there's this idea that if you reach out for help, you're going to somehow lose your job. You're putting your job in jeopardy. And that is not the case. And, and we've shown that through the RPO program, through cop to cop, through what, uh, what, what uh, the sergeant has reiterated about it's OK to get help. Uh, your job isn't in jeopardy. Um, your family, your friends, your health is more important than any job. But there's, there's not a risk out there. So get the help that you need. Th again, thank you all. Uh, as I said at the outset, this this whole concept, this whole program in my mind started with the profound experience in November of 2018 uh, and a horrible call that I got on December 26, 2018, when I was uh, at dinner with my family the day after Christmas. Uh, I hope never to get that call again. Uh, I know that's probably aspirational, but I know that through the work we're doing, uh, we're going to try to make that a reality. So thanks to everyone uh, who participated today. Thank you. Stay safe, stay healthy, and reach out if you need help. Thanks all. Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, guys.